Welcome back to Mr. History's Podcast. Today, we're diving deep into a law, a law older than the United States itself, but yeah, still very much in effect, the Alien Enemies Act. It is kind of like finding a dusty old musket in your attic yeah. and realizing it's still loaded, isn't it? Yeah. We're talking about a law from 1798 that gives the U.S. government power over foreign nationals yeah. from enemy countries during wartime. That's right. Detention, restrictions, even deportation. All based on citizenship, not individual action. Oh, it makes you think. It is mind blowing yeah. that something passed in a world of sailing ships and quill pens could still be relevant in our digital age. Yeah, how that is a lot to come to be. Well, picture the political scene in the late 1700s. The young United States is facing tensions with France, what historians call the Quasi War, and the Federalist Party, led by President John Adams is feeling the heat. Okay, so not a full-blown war, but enough tension to make people nervous. Exactly. The Federalists were convinced no. that foreign agents, specifically those with French sympathies, were trying to undermine the U.S. government. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Political maneuvering. Yeah. And the fear of outsiders influencing elections. Some things never change. It's almost like looking through a time warp, seeing those anxieties hmm. reflected in our own political climate today. But let's get specific. What does this act actually do? Break it down for us. Like we're explaining it to someone who's never even heard of it. Okay. Imagine this. The U.S. is officially at war or the president declares a serious threat to national security. The Alien Enemies Act then empowers the president to decide which foreign nationals pose a threat simply because of their citizenship. Wow. They can then detain restrain, or even deport these individuals, even if they haven't personally done anything wrong. So essentially, the president gets to decide who's dangerous yeah. and what to do about them, mm -hmm. all because of their passports. That's an so incredible amount of power. It is. Especially when you consider for... how difficult it would be to challenge these decisions in court, especially during wartime. You hit the nail on the head. The courts tend to defer to the executive branch on matters of national security, making it incredibly difficult to fight back against these decisions. Now, the act doesn't apply to just any conflict. It specifically kicks in during declared wars or when the president deems there's a serious threat to the nation. Okay, so this act has some serious teeth. But was it just a theoretical threat sitting on the shelf? Or did it actually get used throughout I, history? Oh, it definitely got used. And how it was applied paints a fascinating and at times disturbing Picture of U.S. history. Let's start with a relatively early example. The War of 1812. That was against Great Britain, right? Yeah. Did we start rounding up every British person living in the newly formed United States? Not quite. While the Alien Enemies Act was invoked, it was primarily used for surveillance of British nationals, keeping tabs on their activities and communications. Think of it as a watchful eye, not necessarily an iron fist. So a more measured approach in those early days. Yeah. But how did things evolve as we move forward in history? Was it always this restrained... While things took a more serious turn during World War I, this time, the focus shifted towards Germans and Austrians living in the U.S. I can imagine. Not exactly a popular heritage to have during wartime. Right. Think registration requirements, restrictions on their movements, and yes, even detentions. Wow. The Alien Enemies Act was used more actively during World War I, fueled by fears of espionage and sabotage. So the intensity of the conflict seemingly escalated the use of the act. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing World War II is where things get really complicated and perhaps even darker. You're absolutely right. World War II is where we see the act's potential for injustice on full display, particularly in relation to the internment of Japanese Americans. I've heard about that, but wasn't that technically carried out under a different executive order? You're right. Japanese internment happened under Executive Order 9066, not directly, under the Alien Enemies Act. But here's where it gets interesting. This is where it gets really interesting to me. Precisely. The Alien Enemies Act, with its inherent notion of enemy aliens, created a climate of fear and suspicion that paved the way for such drastic measures. Oh, wow. Even though it wasn't the direct legal instrument, the underlying sentiment it fostered absolutely played a role in this dark chapter of U.S. history. So even if not directly responsible, the act's shadow loomed large over this terrible injustice. Remind us what happened. For those who might not be fully aware. Over 120,000 people of Japanese descent, many of them U.S. citizens, were forcibly removed from their homes and businesses and sent to internment camps simply because of their ancestry. It's chilling to think that their only crime was their heritage. Not individual actions or proven threats, but simply who they were. It makes you think yeah. about how easily fear 
prejudice, and wartime anxieties can override basic human rights, doesn't it? It's a stark reminder that we need to be eternally vigilant in safeguarding civil liberties, especially when fear and paranoia are running high. And that brings us to a crucial question. The Alien Enemies Act is still on the books today, a relic of a bygone era, yet potentially applicable. In our modern world, could it happen again? That's a truly unsettling thought. Stay with us as we unpack the modern relevance of the Alien Enemies Act and explore that very question. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back to Mr. History's podcast. Before the break, we were discussing the chilling implications of the Alien Enemies Act, particularly in light of Japanese internment during World War II. It's a stark reminder that the seemingly outdated law could rear its head again. Right. It's almost like this loaded gun yeah. is sitting there in the legal arsenal. I mean, <laughs> hasn't really been used much since World War II. Right. It largely went dormant after World War II. However, the events of 9-11 brought it back into the spotlight with some legal scholars and politicians even suggesting it could be a tool in the war on terror. Wow, that's unnerving. Did those arguments gain any traction? Not really. Ultimately, yeah. other laws, like the Patriot Act, took center stage in the uh -huh. post-9-11 world. But the fact that the Alien Enemies Act was even considered shows that it's not. This is a dusty historical footnote. It makes you think about how this law would even apply. In today's world, with all the complexities of global conflict and terrorism, it's not like we're dealing with clear-cut nation-state wars anymore. Exactly. Imagine a large-scale cyber attack, not by a traditional enemy nation, but by a shadowy organization with ties to multiple countries. Who's the enemy then? Who could be targeted? Under the Alien Enemies Act, it really throws a wrench into the traditional definition of wartime enemies. It almost feels like the law is struggling to keep up yeah. with the evolving nature of conflict itself. So we've got this law. That gives the president immense power, is potentially applicable in our modern world, and is incredibly difficult to challenge in court. And that all seems to point to one central tension, yeah. isn't it? The tension between security and freedom. Absolutely. We all want to feel safe to protect our nation from threats. But at what cost? Where do we draw the line? The Alien Enemies Act, even if well-intentioned, opens the door to potential abuse and discrimination based solely on nationality, not individual actions. So it forces us to grapple with some tough questions. How much freedom are we willing to sacrifice for safety? What safeguards should be in place to prevent abuses of power? These aren't just questions for legal experts or politicians. These are questions for all of us. You're absolutely right. It's about civic responsibility. The Alien Enemies Act serves as a powerful reminder that history isn't just something we read about in textbooks. It shapes the choices we face today. Understanding this law and its implications can help us be more informed citizens engaging in these vital debates about security, freedom, and the kind of society we want to live in. It's like holding up a historical mirror, isn't it? We see reflections of past anxieties and decisions, and it forces us to ask ourselves, are we making the same mistakes? Are we truly upholding the values we claim to cherish and that introspection is crucial. It compels us to think critically about the laws that govern us and to consider how they impact the lives of real people. What's fascinating here is that the Alien Enemies Act isn't just about national security or legal precedence. It's about the very essence of what it means to belong, to be a citizen, and to have rights that deserve protection even in times of crisis. So if this law were being debated in Congress today, what arguments would you make? What factors would you consider? That's a thought-provoking question, and one that deserves careful consideration. To answer it, we need to move beyond the legal jargon and really delve into the heart of the matter. Let's do that. We'll be right back after a short break. To unpack the potential arguments and considerations surrounding the Alien Enemies Act in today's world, don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Mr. History's podcast. We've been dissecting the Alien Enemies Act, a law that feels both antiquated and eerily relevant in today's world. Before the break, we're about to dive into a thought experiment. If this law were being debated today, what arguments would we hear on both sides? It's a debate that would undoubtedly be fiercely contested, reflecting our deeply held beliefs about security, freedom, and what it means to be an American. Those who support the act, or at least see the need for something like it, would likely argue that. In an age of terrorism and global unrest, we need strong tools to protect ourselves. Right, they might say that. Identifying potential threats based on citizenship, even if it seems discriminatory, is a necessary evil 
to keep the nation safe, especially if those individuals come from countries with known hostile intentions towards the U.S. Precisely. They might also argue that the act provides a clear legal framework for dealing with enemy aliens during times of conflict, preventing chaos, and ensuring swift action. After all, in a crisis, the government needs to be able to act decisively to protect its citizens. But on the flip side, those who oppose the act would likely argue that it's a dangerous relic of a bygone era, ripe for abuse and discrimination. They'd probably point to Japanese internment as a prime example of how this law, even indirectly, can be used to justify terrible injustices. Well, absolutely. They'd emphasize that judging individuals yeah. based solely on their nationality rather than individual actions or proven threats goes against the very core of American values. Due process, equal protection under the law, and the presumption of innocence. They might also point out that in today's interconnected world, defining enemy is far more complex than simply looking at someone's passport. What about dual citizens or individuals who may have been born in a certain country but have lived peacefully in the U.S. for decades? The act doesn't seem equipped to handle those nuances. And that's a key point. Opponents would likely argue that the act is simply too blunt an instrument, too prone to sweeping generalizations and potentially devastating consequences. For individuals who pose no real threat, they might propose alternative approaches, focusing on targeted intelligence gathering, due process, and individualized assessments of risk, rather than blanket judgments based on citizenship. It's a debate with no easy answers, reflecting the inherent tension between security and liberty that every society grapples with. Ultimately, it comes down to how much risk we're willing to tolerate, both in terms of potential threats yeah and potential abuses of power. And perhaps that's the most important takeaway from our deep dive into the Alien Enemies Act. It's not just a historical curiosity or a legal technicality. It's a mirror reflecting our deepest values and anxieties. It forces us to confront uncomfortable questions about who we are as a nation, what principles we're willing to defend, and what sacrifices we're prepared to make in the name of security. It's a sobering thought, but also an empowering one, because by understanding this law, its history and its potential implications, we become more informed citizens, better equipped to participate in these crucial conversations and shape the future we want for ourselves and future generations. If we connect this to the bigger picture, it's a reminder that history isn't just a collection of dates and facts, but a living, breathing force that continues to shape the world we live in. The Alien Enemies Act, a law born in a time of fear and uncertainty, still has the power to spark crucial debates about security freedom, and the very essence of what it means to be an American sister. Well said. A huge thank you to all our listeners for joining us on this deep dive into the Alien Enemies Act. We hope you found it informative, thought-provoking, or perhaps even a little unsettling. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode with anyone who loves a good ghost of history and critical thinking. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep those minds sharp.